let's talk about what I mean by consistency as a mistake. I'm not talking about acid versus base here. And if you're unfamiliar with those terms, acid is a property of relational databases. Uh, the concept of things like atomic transactions, durability, integrity, the kind of things we know and love in terms of a relational database versus base, which stands for basically available, soft state, and eventually consistent. Uh, the thing where if you log onto Twitter from two different terminals, you might see different things at the same time. So we're not talking about the acid versus base properties of databases, and hence we're not talking about NoSQL versus relational. It's not that kind of consistency. This is the kind of consistency which I refer to as a mistake. I run the following query. Select distinct percent free IoT type and compression from DBA tables. And it always astounds me. It doesn't really matter what data, what customer I go to. I run this query and I always get one row back. And that row is this. Percent free 10, IoT type null, compress disabled. Now, why is this a big deal? Why do I view this as a mistake? What this query is telling us that across the entire database for this customer, and I'm a bit being a bit facetious here, the internal dictionary has some descript some difference to this, but for customer tables, what we see is every table is created with percent free 10 because that's the default. Every table is created as a heap table, which is IoT type null, because that's the default. And every table has no compression because compression disabled is the default. We've come to this place now in the Oracle database, which I find as a mistake, which is everyone just uses the defaults. Don't get me wrong, as a DBA, when it comes to creating a database, generally things like the parameters and the storage options, etc., using the defaults is a good thing. You get better support if you can go back to Oracle support and say, here's my database, it's very much defined like the default operations. But this is lower level. This is down in terms of your table levels. We used to tackle this as part of physical design. And we sort of throw back many years ago where as database administrators or developers as well, we actually went through that, what, what people now say critically as waterfall, but that process of do a logical data model, come up with a logical data model, generate some ER diagrams from entities. And then there was this separate phase where we actually did physical design. How can we best lay out the tables on the database for the needs of the business but of course, that pretty much has gone nowadays. Nowadays, in the era of DevOps, what's happening is DDL to create objects is coming flying across the, the, the fence, either from developers or others, flying across the fence as fast as possible. And it's probably not even touching the DBA. It's going into some automated process where that DDL is being applied straight into the database. And so we never even get to see it. And thus, physical design has almost become a thing of the past. My verdict here is there is still no excuse for us as DBAs to not do physical design, even if we're not seeing the DDL, even if it's being wrapped up in some sort of automation process, such as Liquibase, Ansible, et cetera. All it means is nowadays in the world of DevOps is we should be doing our physical design later. And what I mean by later is after the fact, after the tables have gone in, there's nothing to stop us from doing that and capturing that benefit later. So let's tackle those three things one at a time. Let's talk about percent free 10 first. The reason I think percent free 10 is generally a mistake is when I look at most computer projects, and I've drawn a little graph here showing a project, we have the various phases of the project. So at the top is phase one, which starts at the earliest point in time, then phase two and phase three up to phase N. And there's always a project in, there's always a phase in the documents for that project called the archival phase. This is where we will remove old data and keep our database a steady state, et cetera. And yes, that phase is generally in the document uh, or the yellow sticky that's stuck up on the wall as part of a scrum or a sprint. But tell you what, it's the one phase that never ever gets done. You know, we used to call it just, we've run out of budget. Now we call it something more fancy. We call it technical debt. But either way, archiving is one of those things that just never gets done. In fact, if I change the graph slightly, my view is always, if the current phase of a project is phase N, where phase N is indicated by that dotted line, the archive stage is always N plus one. And it doesn't matter as the project moves along, the archive phase moves along to be just always out of reach. And in particular, 
databases are actually changing for genuine reasons as well, not just because we haven't got the budget or the inclination to do archiving. Databases are changing, and you've probably seen this slide ram down your throat many, many times over the past few years about big data, you know, volume, velocity, variety, that, you know, if one more person, you know, tells me about the four Vs again, I'm going to absolutely lose my mind. But as a result, we're storing more and more data, and we're never, ever getting rid of it. What does that mean? It means database core fundamentals, the four things you do as DML, select, insert, update, and delete, aren't really applicable anymore. We're never deleting, and we're very rarely updating. We're simply taking vast amounts of data, slamming it into the database, and then querying it. Under that new model, that more modern model of database, percent free 10 is a bad idea because percent free 10 is all about updating data in place. Even if we're still deleting data, even if we're deleting old data, we actually managed to have one of those lucky projects where we did actually get into the archive phase of our project. Even then, percent free is not really applicable to systems that just do inserts and deletes. All that percent free is applicable for is if you're updating data in place. For that reason, my view is the default, you're probably default for percent free should be percent free equals one. Because why reserve 10% of your entire database for free space that will never be filled? Because it's only going to be filled if you update rows. And moreover, it's only going to be filled if you update rows that make them larger. So percent free equals 10, I think, is the product of a bygone era. Systems were different in those days. We should be looking at percent free one as being our default. You might want to look at manipulating any trans if you're using percent free one, just in case you expect future updates, because percent free one may limit the amount of space for ITL entries. But it's very rare that you'll need to do that. But I think percent free one is a logical default for most of our databases nowadays. Let's move on to compression now. Now, before you get upset with me, I'm not talking about the advanced compression facility, which is obviously a separately charged option unless you're using some of our cloud facilities. So I'm talking about the basic level of compression here. And it's amazing how few people use it on their systems. Sometimes people use it on their data warehouses, but very few use it on their transactional systems. But this is one of my favorite sort of quotes. I, I apologize to whoever the author is. I couldn't find the name of the author. It's certainly not my quote, but I love it. And that's data ages like wine and applications age like fish. And it's true. Generally, older data isn't data that becomes obsolete. Obviously, older data sometimes increases in value like a fine wine and typically in bulk. Modern data, we're looking for one particular transaction. What are the transactions for this customer? As data gets older, we're looking for things like what are the yearly sales? What's the 10-year sales? How can we use that to build forecasts? So older data is often accessed in bulk, and that's where its real value comes in. And here's the key point. Compressing that older data is a free operation. It doesn't cost you any license fee in the Oracle database to use basic compression. It's available straight out of the box on Enterprise Edition. And the key thing is basic compression is also something that can be done online in modern versions of the Oracle database. That opens up huge opportunities in terms of your transactional systems. I can have my existing data just being inserted in the normal way. It won't be compressed. But for no license fee, I can take my older data and compress it while my systems are actually running. And I thought I'd show you a little bit of a demo of that. So let's do a new share. So hopefully we can all see that and the font is large enough. So I'm going to create a table called T here. And it's 50 copies of DBA objects. DBA objects is typically about 80,000 rows. So you can see there I've got about 4 million rows in my table. That's my indicative measure of a transactional table. Now, to do some transactions, you can see the table is about 80,000 blocks in size. Now, to do some transactions, to simulate some transactions while I'm going to do the compress, I'm going to create a procedure called, called insert. It's not particularly um, spectacular. What I'm doing is 60 iterations of inserting a single row. And each row will have a negative object ID. It makes it nice and easy to find it in the table because currently the table only has positive object IDs. And I'm going to sleep for one second. So because it's 60, an iteration of 60, that job's going to run for 
one minute. And every second it's gonna insert some rows. Now, rather than firing up another window, which will make my Zoom extensively complicated, I'm gonna submit that as a job. So I'm gonna submit it as a job. And with Windows, jobs may sometimes take a little while to start running. So to prove I'm not fooling you, I'm gonna do this little routine here to make sure that the job is actually running. It's finished now, which says, yes, that job is definitely running. So while I'm inserting rows now, one every second, I'm gonna actually move my table, my transactional table and compress it and do it online. So it won't take too long, the table's not too large, only four million rows. But while it's busily compressing, be aware that we've got a job in the background running and inserting rows. To prove that to you, I can actually query my table called T, where all the new rows, their object IDs that were negative to see, and you can see they've been regularly coming in. It took about 30 seconds, it's been running for 30 seconds. If we look at the actual data, you can see it's 15, 16, 17, 18, starting from the top. We are still quite happily inserting one row a second. They didn't get blocked, they didn't get held up, etc. We can do compression online while transactions are occurring in our databases. If I go look at the size of the table after I've compressed it, you might see something that looks a bit alarming. It looks like, oh my goodness, the table is still 80,000 blocks. The only reason that is there is that's a figure that's calculated by Optimizer Statistics. If I actually regather the stats, chug, 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 we'll see that it's actually not 80,000 blocks anymore. The table is actually about one quarter the size. So there I have a system which has online transactions still coming in. They're not being impacted. I can compress the data, which goes and tabs all the existing data, which in a real situation is obviously your older data, and I can compress it while transactions come in. Now, when I'm doing queries on this table for older data, like show me all of last year's results, all of last 10 years' results, then of course, that's going to be approximately four times faster on full table scans, because this is now much, much smaller. Don't get me wrong, new transactions are coming in and they are not compressed but I can do this compression activity once a week, once a month, et cetera, at appropriate times. Don't get me wrong, if I'm absolutely slamming this thing with transactions, that would not be a good time to do a compression. What we're looking for is a quiet time where the number of transaction volume is as low as we can manage, and then the compression won't be impacted and won't be as impactful on transactions. But you can see there, it's not actually stopping them from recurring. The compression runs while transactions are quite happily being created and committed. There's no blocking locks going on there. So it's pretty cool. So that's compression. I've, had, I've covered percent free and we've covered compression. So we've covered compression. Let's now talk about the last one, IoT type. And IoT type is what kind of tables do you have in your system besides heap tables? And the key thing here is really understanding customer needs. And I'll show you a demo now that I've done um, at Oracle Code a number of times, since the, uh, the OC prefix in the script name there. But I've added some to it so I can actually see what's going on behind the scenes. I do this script at Oracle Code uh, as a way of sort of a pseudo magic trick, but we'll do it uh, much more openly here. So let's do another share. So this is the magic demo we do at Oracle Code events. We have a table called My Transactions One. It's uh, effectively a simulation of customer transactions. There's no rows in the table and we're gonna put 200,000 rows into it using this table called tab 200K. I'm gonna do this query now on customer 160. The first query, the key figure here is consistent gets. We can see 533 consistent gets. That's because we had to pass the query. If we do it the second time now that we pass it, it's 402 consistent gets and that's repeatable. We can see it is 402. That's what it costs to get customer 160 details from that table. Now I'll look at my transactions number two. It's got the identical column structure. It's empty just like my transactions one and I'll copy all the rows from my transactions one to my transactions two. So they are identical in terms of data. I count the rows, there's 200,000 in each table. I look at the row, the differences in data. Transactions one minus transactions two. Transactions two minus transactions one. There's no difference in data. They even had the same indexing structure. So this is what we do at the Oracle Code events. We say, look at these, these tables are intrinsically identical. To refresh your memory, if I look at my transactions one for customer ID 160, it's still 402 consistent gets. That's what it costs. Let's run the exact same query against my transactions two for the exact same customer 
bear in mind it's the exact same data and it's 131 consistent gets. So that's almost four times faster. And don't forget, that's the first query. Now that I've parsed it, now it's 39 consistent gets. Now it's 10 times faster. And that's where we leave the demo at Oracle Co. We say, look at this, isn't it amazing? You know, it's some magic trickery here. Let's actually move through to actually what I want to display here, which is about the IoT type. Most of us probably will have guessed that the difference here is the way we've structured the table. My transactions one, if we look at the DDL, is just a stock standard heap table, like so many people do for every single table in their database. And for a lot of tables, that's fine. If we look here, you can see the word using index, but that's purely for the constraint, my transaction PK. It's the constraint definition here that is actually the index. Let's now look at my transactions number two. It's doing some DDL, DBMS metadata DDL as well. Let's see what we get for my transactions number two. And here's where we can see the difference. It is an in organization index table. Let me try that again in English. It is an organization index table. The data is stored as an index, not as a heap table. And that's why we got those massive benefits because all the rows for each customer are clustered together in an index structure, therefore less IO. This is the magic we don't show people um, at Oracle Code. But here's a classic example of where if my business requirements are all about getting information for customers quickly, then an IoT on customer ID and the primary key would be an obvious choice. There will be an expense to inserting rows into that table. But if the governing business functions, the thing that really matters to your business are how can I get customer details back to the customer on their web browser or their mobile device fast, then an IoT might be the perfect fit. It is about understanding business requirements that is critical. Let's bring this back to physical design. I said with the DevOps world, sometimes it's too late. That table may be already be in production now as a heap table. And to convert it to an IoT is not something that can be done online easily. There's no alter command that can do it. You can use DBMS redefinition, but it can't be done easily in current versions of Oracle. There are other options available to you. You could look at attribute clustering, which doesn't change a table from being a heap, but still gets those benefits. Let's have a little look at this demo. What do I call it? Plust. So I'm taking my transactions one. This is the table that's just a plain heap table. And I'm adding this attribute called clustering by linear order. That is simply a dictionary definition. It doesn't actually do anything to the data yet. If I actually look at my query, you can see I'm still at 400 plus consistent gets for customer 160. But what I can do online without interrupting service, as we saw, is I can actually move that table online. That will reload the data and now take into account that dictionary information saying I would like the data clustered by customer ID. I regather some stats and now when I look at customer 160 for my transaction one, which is a heap table and used to be 400 consistent gets, now I'm down to 60. I'm not as good as the IoT, but I'm very, very close. I'm you know, still looking at eight, what, six, seven fold performance in benefit there by using linear clustering. So these are some of the options available to us when it comes to physical design after the fact. I can't convert to an IoT, but I can look at things like linear clustering or even randomized clustering to actually get performance benefits based on business requirements. And I keep stressing, it is based on those business requirements. If your system says, I need to get data by transaction ID, then you might look at a different structure. But in this example, we're looking at customer ID, that's the key.